Hello, and welcome to another episode of This Week in Hearing. I'm your host, Brian Taylor. And our topic this week is hidden hearing loss and biotech approaches to treating it. And I'm really pleased to have our guest here today, who is an expert in this, uh, Celia Belline, who's the CEO of Silcare Therapeutics, which is a biotech company specializing in neurotechnology. Uh, Celia, welcome to This Week in Hearing. It's great to have you back. Thank you, Brian. Very happy to to be again with you. <laughs> yeah, it's been a couple of years, I think. And uh, since it's been a while, uh, I thought it would be a good chance to maybe update us on um, the mission of Silcare and uh, your role within the company. Yeah. So I'm Celia Bellin. I'm a co-founder and CEO of Silcare. Uh, Silcare is a biotech specialized in auditory sciences. It means that we work both on the detection of some types of hearing loss and the treatment uh, with drugs uh, that we try to, to cure. Um, we started the company back in 2014. We are based in the south of France. This is where our headquarters is. But we're also in the U.S., in the Boston area since 2017. So I have teams both in the U.S. and in France. Um, we. Um, have a platform, an R&D platform that enables us to develop any types of modalities for addressing different types of hearing loss, meaning gene therapy, cell therapy, small molecules, any kind of modality. So we test the efficacy, the distribution, the treatment scheme, uh, uh, the dose that needs to be used. We select the population that we want to target, the disease that we want to treat. So all that kind of things, which is a, so an R&D pharma platform dedicated to hearing. And back in 2020, we in license compounds that are small molecules uh, with the objective to target cochlear synaptopathy, which is the first stage of age-related hearing loss. So the objective for us was to try to address hearing disorders at the earliest stage as we can to be able to stop the progression and reverse uh, the disease, which is what we do. So we now have a lead compound that is called CL001. Uh, that is ready to enter phase 2A. So in a clinical development from a pharma perspective, it means that we're ready to start treating patients that have that cochlear synaptopathy with our drug CL001. Uh, when you do a clinical strategy, uh, one of the important points that you need to figure out is how you're going to demonstrate in a short sample of patients, the efficacy of a drug on a given disease. And that is not so easy because you need a very homogeneous population for which you understand very precisely the disease and where you know the size effect of your drug potentially. So what you will be able to reverse and how much the patient will feel it concretely. And so to do that, what we have done is that we have selected subpopulation of patients that have that disease, so cochlear synaptopathy, earlier and stronger. And before engaging and treating them with our drug, what we have done is that we have tried to characterize very precisely their auditory function to confirm what we thought, which is they have a high prevalence of cochlear synaptopathy and how much they have that cochlear synaptopathy. And the first population of patients that was selected um, was type 2 diabetes, because this was already somehow published, not necessarily in the sense that we have demonstrated now, but uh, it was already known somehow that they had that cochlear synaptopathy with a higher prevalence. And so we did a study that is called Diamond that we are going to publish uh, soon. That uh, into which we actually tested more than 330 patients with type 2 diabetes with some criteria of inclusion and exclusion, of course. And we have looked at their auditory function and we have confirmed the presence of cochlear synaptopathy. Now, I won't say more because this is going to be published, so I need to keep the secret. All right. <laughs> All right. No, I completely understand. Um, if we could step back just a moment, you mentioned this uh, condition called cochlear synaptopathy. Um, is it fair to say that the, the more common name for that would be hidden hearing loss? That what some people call it, right? Yes, right. It's just 
it's kind of a hot topic here in the United States amongst uh, hearing care professionals and audiologists. You're seeing more and more published about fitting hearing aids on people that have normal audiograms and that kind of thing. Can you tell us a little bit about how common that condition is and uh, some, you know, maybe a little bit more about what we think is happening inside the ear? Yeah, well, it's extremely common, uh, common condition. Um, if you consider that this is the early stage of age-related hearing loss, so the prevalence is at least as important as age-related hearing loss that is more published than this hidden hearing loss part. Mm -hmm. um, what, we've, what we see is that in some population of patients, it's so close to 40% of the population that can have that condition uh, at some point in time. Uh, w what is... Uh, alerting or or aggravating uh, or in, or giving more importance to this hidden hearing loss is that it, since that we see it uh, coming earlier than before so at younger population when you talk with those younger population they already have that condition much earlier than before and this is certainly linked to lifestyle condition and earphones and no silence and all that kind of thing that you see uh, uh, and you know so um, what, it ha what, what it means in the ear, so it's, it's aggravating by noise, by inflammation, by age. Uh, it's a disconnection of the synapses from the inner houses to the auditory nerve. But it's a retractation of those synapses. So there's no death of the synapses yet, and the fibers are just retracted. And it means that you have about 20 fibers that link the inner houses to the auditory nerve. And um, when you start to have less and less and less connection, the signal is less and less and less good. And this is when you start not understanding um, speech in a noisy environment. Uh, but those synapses and those fibers, they're not dead. So that's the good news. And for many years, from if we hear and, and uh, the key opinion leaders in the field uh, talking about the topic better than I do right now. Mm -hmm. So they explain that actually... Uh, there's a long period of time where you can still have those fibers broke again and those synapses reconnected. And this is what we try to do with cell care. Exactly. Now, that's a very clear explanation. Thank you for that. Um, I'm curious to know, how do you administer the intervention or the therapeutic? How is that, how is that done? Yeah, so it's a trust in panic administration, so that we consider as a standard practice at the ENT doctor. It's a thin needle that will be behind the tympanic membrane. And you go into the middle ear, you inject a gel form or a lipidic form, so something that will actually go on the round window membrane and by diffusion goes into the cochlea. So with CL001, we intend to do only one injection. And after one injection, what happens is that the drug is still in the cochlea, in our ear fluid of the cochlea, for 30 days at least after a single administration. So it remained a long time within the cochlea. And what we saw also with our drug is that after, after this single administration, when you treat cochlear synaptopathy in reference model of cochlear synaptopathy, 35 days after the injection of our drug, you have a full recovery of the amplitude of the um, auditory brainstem response, the wave one that we talk a lot about that, that would represent, you know, if there is a decrease of the amplitude, the presence of cochlear synaptopathy. And we also see, and, and this is of course in preclinical settings, a full uh, reconnection of the ribbon synapses pre- and postsynaptic connection, and we see a co-localization of pre- and postsynaptic marker. So meaning that there's really a reconnection that functionally is translated into a better hearing in noise. Right, and that's the trial, the, the SIL001 trial that you're... So this study on type 2 diabetes patients is supposed to start at the end of the year, beginning of next year. So that's the target. So at the oh. moment... We are preparing the study. So we are at a moment where we do what we call the site qualification visit. So identifying the sites that will perform the procedure. In, in our study, the, the, I don't say the tricky part, but the originality of the study 
is that we are making uh, endocrinologue and diabetologue work together with ENT. So there's a kind of couple <laughs> into the study. And so we qualify both type 2 diabetes sites and ENT sites, ENT being the one administrating the drug, but the diabetologue being the one identifying and recruiting the patient. That's very, very good to know. Thank you. Um, I, I was on your website recently and I noticed there was another clinical trial, SIL-003. Could you tell us a little bit about that trial and what that's about? So SIL-003, it's not a trial, it's another compound. Okay, another compound. Yeah. All right. So CL001 is the compound, and then the study, they have names, Resplong, Respawn, React. So we have several names, Sapphire, Diamond. So that's the name of the study. CL001 is our lead compound. So the first one, the most advanced. And then we have another one that is called CL003. And this okay. compound is a little different. I cannot uh, say a lot about it because we're still in, uh, you know, uh, identifying a patent and protection pathway, identifying target population, uh, but it's a, it's it's going to be a very interesting compound as well. Okay, well, well, well uh, it's a reason to have you back in a few years. Yeah. Well, uh, uh, another question I have for you is, um, you know, over the next three to five years, if you can kind of uh, project over that period of time, how do you see? some of these compounds coming to market, how do they address, how, how would they be used possibly in the clinic? If you could kind of give us your take on that. Yeah. Um, so this is a, a, a huge work that I think every company working in this hearing field is, are, are, they are, is doing. It's, it's very important to identify how the drug is going to be administered, what's the burden of disease, which patients are going to require that treatment and on which basis and what's effect and um, added value uh, the, the drug will bring to the patient. So I, I don't have a final answer on this. It's really work in progress. Uh, what we imagine, so hidden hearing loss is one thing. The other thing is that cochlear synaptopathy has been described as being potentially one cause of tinnitus. And when you talk about tinnitus, there's no more question about the burden of disease. And people with tinnitus, and especially with severe tinnitus, they are all looking, and this is something we've discussed already together, but they are looking for uh, a treatment uh, now. So it, it's very, very clear. So there are different aspects in how the drug is going to be marketed and then used by patients. There is the one that say, we need to address cochlear synaptopathy because it, it also affects the active population and that's um, a disability uh, daily, not to hear in a noisy environment. But for this, you still need to educate people and make them understand that the earlier they treat hearing disease, the better it is. Because otherwise, they think it's an aging disease. And so it's normal that you lose your hearing along the time, which is not the case. And that's the same for hearing aids, you know, and that's a barrier to uh, being equipped with hearing aids as well. So unless you really make this link with, you know, cognitive decline, dementia, and you put bad words uh, saying that this is super important because if you don't do it, there's going to be something worse happening. Right, right. And, and in that case, they start to understand <laughs> what the problem is and why they need to address it. Otherwise, it's, it's still not really yet in the mind of people that they need to care about their hearing as early as they can. But when you talk about tinnitus, and this is what uh, is interesting with cochlear synaptopathy or, or hidden hearing loss, is that if effectively treating cochlear synaptopathy or hidden hearing loss, finally, and I put bracket, I put all the, uh, I would say, hypotheses behind that. There's nothing uh, uh, sure. Um, but if treating and addressing cochlear synaptopathy means that you have an effect on tinnitus, in that case, no question, you're on the market and you have patients, a lot of patients. We receive about 20 emails per week of patients that wants to enter into our clinical trial, both for tinnitus or severe difficulty of hearing in a noisy environment. Well, I can imagine the, uh, the demand for something like this is incredible. Everybody is looking for a solution mm. that has it. Um, 
that's 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 good to know. So I think the future sounds pretty bright. You must be optimistic about uh, what you're bringing to market. I, I'm very optimistic also because we are. I, I think we are all trying to raise awareness about this uh, hearing loss, the importance of caring about hearing, and we are all. And when all I'm talking about, both the you know the companies working on technology, diagnostics, the one having drugs, whether it's gene therapy, cell therapy, uh, small molecule, whatever, we are all trying really to, and we're working together to raise awareness about uh, hearing care, and uh, and and I think it's really moving very fast at the moment. We see a lot of things happening, um, very promising, and we see new strategies for, because it's it's also about strategy, drug development. It's not just, you know, bringing something as a solution. It's how you bring it, how you demonstrate that this is working in a such, in such a short period of time and with, with so few patients finally. And it's still a lot of money, <laughs> so it's very, very important that uh, all together we try to find new avenue to, to demonstrate the efficacy of of, uh, of of different treatments uh, for hearing loss. I see. Uh, I'm here with uh, Celia Belin, who's the CEO of Silcare Therapeutics, which is a, uh, I guess, U.S. and France-based biotech company that specializes in neurotology. And uh, my last question for you, Celia, is uh, can you share with us your website or where our viewers might be able to learn more about your uh, company and what you're uh, working on? Yes, that's your easiest question. <laughs> it's www.silcare, C-I-L-C-A-R-E. Dot com. Excellent. And uh, I've been on the website. There's a, 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 a tremendous amount of great information there. And Celia, we really appreciate your time and we hope we can have you back on uh, and you can share more details about some of the findings from these clinical trials that you mentioned. Yes. Thank you, Brian. Right, thanks for your time.